In recent decades, millions of people have drifted away from Jesus and their Catholic faith. Sadly, many may never find their way back. I'm Tom Peterson, and I believe that God has called me to use my background in media to be a catalyst in the new evangelization. Our organization produces inspiring and creative evangelization messages that have helped lead hundreds of thousands of inactive Catholics, converts, agnostics, and atheists home to Jesus and His Holy Church. Join us as we travel across North America to bring you stories of heartbreak, redemption, and transformation as the Holy Spirit leads His people home. God has an extraordinary plan for each of our lives. He wants us to spend eternity in heaven with Him and bring as many people with us as possible. This is Catholics Come Home. Now, I welcome you to my home to hear their amazing stories. Welcome to Catholics Come Home. In today's episode, we'll meet a man from Silverton, Oregon, who works in a paper mill. He was born into a large family and baptized Catholic, but never really practiced his faith. As life went on, he got involved in addictions and drifted further from God. But through God's grace and mercy and seeing a Catholics Come Home evangelmercial, our guest returned to his Catholic heritage. Like everyone else in this series, today's guest came home to the church with the help of Catholics Come Home and responding to a call of the Holy Spirit. I'd like you to meet Aurelio Castillo. Aurelio, welcome home to the Catholic Church and welcome to our program. Thank you, Tom. We're so glad you're here to tell your story and share your testimony. But I think a great way to start, and what the viewers love to hear, is about your childhood, where you grew up, a little bit more about your family growing up. Well, I was born in 1957, a little town in Texas, mm -hmm. Edinburgh, Texas, about an hour um, from the Mexican border. Oh. And my family, I'm one of 12. 12? Where yes. do you fall into that? Uh, I'm order? third from the youngest. Uh, well, God bless your parents for being open to life. Well, they were open to life. Uh, unfortunately, I, my father left the family when oh. I was uh, about five years old. Oh my gosh, and your mom had to raise the 12 children alone? Well, uh, she did, and she had help with yeah. my older sisters and brothers. Yes, so it was tough, huh? It's very tough. And what did your mom do for a living, or was she just pretty much taking care of you guys? Well, we lived, actually, the little house was a two-bedroom house. Uh, it was on a dairy farm where my, my dad used to work. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I really don't know that part of uh, my life. You were I young. I was too young mm -hmm. and don't know what happened with my parents and why they divorced or why they separated. And were you poor growing up with that many children and not two incomes? I can remember not having a whole lot of things. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have any toys. Yeah. We were really, really poor. Tell us about your faith background. What was your mom's faith like and, and your dad's while he was around, but what was your faith background like and what influence did you have in your life? Well, my mother was a uh, devout Catholic, uh, although I don't remember us going to church mm -hmm. on Sundays, but I know she prayed a lot Mm -hmm. and she had uh, pictures of uh, certain saints sure. and she she prayed all the time. And you did make some of the sacraments when you were young? Well we, I was baptized uh -huh. probably about six months after I was born and I don't know who my godparents are. Um, a lot of times uh, they could have been drinking buddies of my dad. Wow. Did you make your first Holy Communion? I didn't make my first Holy Communion until 1967. Okay, a little bit later. Yeah, so it would have been 10 years later. Yeah, and how about reconciliation uh, or confirmation? Somehow or another, I uh, was never confirmed. Yeah, until later in life. Yeah. Until later in life. Yeah. yeah. So uh, what was life like growing up, and did you stay in Texas for a while? Well, we were in Texas about, about six years. Mm -hmm. And then we basically followed, my dad took off and went to work in the, the states up north in the, in the United States. Yes. And so we didn't have much in Texas, a very poor little town. So did you move as well? Yes. And where did you end up going? Well, we moved to the state of Washington. Uh -huh. 
And we um, lived in Washington until 1978. And what was your faith background like in those years as you were getting a little older and as you moved? What do you remember about faith back then? Well, when we moved to Washington, I do remember going to church occasionally. And I know that uh, my mom, my mother needed um, us to be catechized. And so they sent us to CCD classes. Good. And that would have been uh, about 1967, 68. Mm -hmm and I got three years of CCD education. Did you like church and did you have a relationship with the Lord at that age? I can say that I didn't really like church mm -hmm. and didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And as you grew up, uh, did you go to school or get married? What happened next? Well, I was going to school and, and uh, really not practicing my faith. Mm -hmm. Um, it wasn't part of your heritage, right? Part of your background, much at no, least. No, no, it wasn't. Um, about ninth grade, um, I was the oldest of, of, of the family by that time. Yes. All my brothers and sisters were married. Huh? And so I dropped out of school. Huh? And I went to work full time. Huh? And where did you work? Well, I worked for a company that produced fertilizers in the okay. state of Washington. I and I, was, I got a part-time job at first. And then uh, I dropped out of school to go to work for them full time. Wow. The money was too good. And how old were you at this point? I would have been uh, 17. Wow. 16, 17 years old. So I was trying to be the breadwinner for the house. And you eventually met your wife and got married. And I met my, my wife, Maria, um, about the first year uh, that I started working full time. Wow. So and you were young. We were very young. Did you get married in a Catholic church? We did. And that was because Maria wanted to have a church wedding. Good for her. And I couldn't understand why, why it was so important. It wasn't on your radar. But it wasn't it was, on my radar. Yeah. Uh, Maria wanted a, a church wedding. Good for Maria. <laughs> with all the details that are Catholic. Yeah. And so that was your journey and you're done. You came home to the church and everything is smooth sailing after that. Not really, Tom. <laughs> um, we were married in 1978. And um, I also lost my job that, that year. And so we moved to Oregon. We made our life in, in Oregon. Coming up, you'll find out what prompted Aurelio to take another look at the Catholic faith. So on the outside, everything was perfect. On the inside, I felt miserable. I felt like I was, I was living a lie. There will come a day when each of us will be asked to review the movie of our life and give an account to God. We will sorrowfully relive the bad times and joyfully revisit the good. Thankfully, no matter what you've done, there is hope. Since Jesus came not to condemn the world, but to save it. So if you've been away from church for a while, we invite you to come home and find the peace that only comes from God. Visit CatholicsComeHome.org. Aurelio, you had a Catholic wedding, you had a wife who cared about her faith, and you started growing in your faith with your wife for a few years, correct? We did. Uh, it was 1978, and the father that married us, Father Bill Vogel, just the nicest person you could ever run into. He really cared about the two of us. That's awesome. Tell us about your faith life for the first few years of marriage. About the first six years of our marriage, we started to volunteer at St. At Luke's Catholic Church. Uh -huh in Woodburn, where we were making our home. Nice. And we were just really learning our faith and, and, and we were able to share it with our Beautiful. parishioners. And did you start having children? We started, we tried to have children right off the get-go. Yeah. And Maria had uh, two miscarriages almost oh, back to back. I'm sorry. But you eventually had three daughters. Yes, we have three daughters. Praise God. So in the first few years of marriage, you were growing in faith. The priest was helping you. What happened that started pulling you away from the Catholic Church and your faith? Well, about six years into our marriage, uh, we, um, we thought we were doing great in our, in our faith. And I have a, a few siblings that had already left the Catholic Church. And they started to kind of draw us away from it. 
Were they doing other things in other faith communities or no church at all? They joined other churches. They were basically evangelical mm -hmm. Christians. Yep. And they were pretty adamant about their faith and, and uh, uh, persistent. To help pull you out of the To pull camp. us out of the church, yes. What did you and Maria do faith-wise? Well, we asked questions. We, I remember personally going to the priest and sitting down with him and, and, and asking the priest, well, we're baptized, we're Christian, aren't we? And the father would answer, of course you are. Yes. You have, you have uh, the sacraments and you're a Christian. Well, you went to the right source to get the answers, but that didn't solve everything. You ended up drifting away from your faith, or at least you said making excuses not to go to church. Yeah, after um, more persistence from my siblings, I started to question my faith, mm -hmm. and I started to drift away from the faith. I tried to find every excuse not to go to church on Sundays. And you had worked nights at a paper mill, so you were tired and found that as an excuse not to go to church as well. Oh, I certainly did. Your life hit rock bottom at a point because you started getting into an addiction. What was that all about? Yes, I started working at a paper mill, mm -hmm. and I was working a rotating shift, which changed every nine days. Which is hard on your body, working days and nights and different hours. It certainly is. It, it really took a toll on me, and I had very little time to think about church. Mm -hmm. And so I got involved in pornography, mm -hmm. and it was not internet pornography. There was no internet at that mm -hmm. time. Um, it was basically, you can pull over to a bookstore in, uh, in Oregon, there's quite a bit of uh, places where... It's a pretty secular area. It's very secular. Mm -hmm. And it was easy, mm -hmm. and it wasn't hurting anybody. At least you thought. Well, mm -hmm. I was certain that it, that it wasn't hurting anybody. At the time, sure. Yes. Although it was hurting you and obviously your family, but you didn't know it at the time. Uh, how long were you addicted to pornography? Well, I would say it was from... 1986 to 20, 2011. Wow. So it was about 25 years that you were addicted to pornography. Yes. What was your life like during that, and what was your family life like during that time? Well, if you would have looked at my family life, we had an ideal family. I had three daughters, a beautiful wife, and we had a really nice house, and I had really good work, mm -hmm. and we had a good income. Mm -hmm. So on the outside, everything was perfect. And how did you feel inside, though? On the inside, I felt miserable. I felt like I was, I was living a lie. Yeah. There's a word called duplicity, where you feel like you're living two lives, one for the public and one that you know inside. And you feel torn because you're two different people. That's true. I, I know I was living two different lives. We could go to church on Sunday and Sunday evening I had to go to work at night mm -hmm. and I could stop by a bookstore and pick up pornography. And had you gone to confession during this time and tried to get out of the habit? I had not gone to confession since before we got married. So those graces that are available in the sacrament of reconciliation, you weren't disposing yourself to them. So you were fighting this battle or in this case not fighting the battle, just kind of living that life. And it all started because you were tired. True. I give a talk at parish missions on confession, and one of the little acronyms I use is HALT. When we're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, we're more vulnerable, and the devil can attack us. You were obviously a little bit lonely, working those different shift hours, and certainly uh, you were tired, and you were at a weak point, and he found a door in to your soul to help influence you. Yeah, it was an addiction that I felt wasn't hurting anybody and, I, and it would take care of the needs that I had for uh, either loneliness or just desires that I felt um, I, was never, I was never given any um, opportunities to learn how to be a father. Mm. So during these years you were feeling lonely. Um, did you think about God or want to stop or what was on your heart at that time? Well, I always thought about God on Sundays, the Sundays that we would go to church. You, you couldn't help but think about God. But He wasn't part of your life the rest of the week. He wasn't part of my life the rest of the week. And I felt guilty about that. Mm -hmm. that there's a feeling that I knew I was doing wrong. And yet, since I'm not hurting anybody, 
I can still continue to do this and still go to church on Sunday. That was the lie that the evil one was trying to tell you and you were buying into it because it was easier to stay in that lifestyle. And maybe perhaps you didn't know how to crawl out of the hole. Yeah, I didn't know how to crawl out. Mm -hmm. And I kept getting deeper and deeper into that. What happened next in your life that gave you some hope, helped you to crawl out of the hole? Well, usually on my way home from work late at night, I could either stop at somewhere that wasn't good for me, mm -hmm. or I could just go straight home because I was tired. Right. And I could turn on the radio perhaps, or get home and watch uh, a television show. Sure. And I accidentally bumped into a radio station, huh. and it happened to be an EWTN radio station. Praise God. About two o'clock in the morning. Uh, and what did you hear that changed things? Well, I heard uh, a parish mission, I believe it was, mm -hmm. talking about sin and how the devil works as evil lies. And I found myself thinking, that's me. Yeah. You felt convicted. You said you, suddenly the light bulb went off. Yes. What did you do about it? Did you go to confession? Did you want to make amends and change your life? Oh, I didn't go to confession. By that time, it had been probably over 25 years since I'd been to confession. Wow. I was too afraid to go to confession. Well, why were you afraid? I'm a bad person. Yeah. I thought I was a bad person. See, that's the lie they that don't the want accuser, me. and the devil's called the nickname the accuser for a reason. He wants us to think we can't be forgiven, we won't be, we won't be accepted. But that's opposite of Christ's loving mercy where that priest in the confessional, in Persona Christi, wants to welcome us home, wants to forgive us. In our movie, Evangemercial, we talk about Christ didn't come to condemn the world, he came to save it. But the devil loves to tell that lie that, oh, you won't be forgiven, you won't be accepted. And you were buying that lie, weren't you? I was certainly buying that, that lie, yes. So what was the catalyst, and how did Catholics Come Home fit in, that helped you to suddenly take another look at faith and get back into the sacramental life? Well, at that time, I don't believe Catholics Come Home was on the air yet. Uh -huh. Not as the TV show, but we had evangelicals right. and the websites. So I found that I needed to come home. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how. Yeah. So what I did after work one morning, I went to the local Catholic church there where I work. Nice. To talk to a priest. Praise God. And what happened? He welcomed me with open arms. Awesome. He first provided me with a Bible and some literature and said, you need to get back to church and you need to get back to confession. Those were his first words. And how did you feel when you went to that sacrament of reconciliation for the first time in 25, 30 years? I was terrified, to tell you the truth. Going in? Going in. But as I came out, I've heard different stories from several people say, I felt a load come off my back. Yes. Well, Tom, that's what it felt like. I felt cleansed from within. I felt like a, a load of bricks had been taken off my back. That's all I can say about it. We have an evangelical called Heavy Burdens, and we've heard that testimony from so many people. They say, I felt I was carrying a 100-pound bag of rocks on my back, and after confession, I felt free. I felt for the first time in my life that I didn't have that burden. That's exactly how you felt, isn't it? Yes, it is. The Father also recommended that I get back to the church and go through an RCIA program. To learn your faith. To learn my faith. Because you really never learned it to I really, begin with. I really never learned my faith. Yeah. And so um, I took a year of RCIA, and it was the best thing I could have ever done in my life. Praise God. In our final interview segment, you'll learn what helps Aurelio grow in his Catholic faith. And we meet every Tuesday, and we do a short Bible study, and we do uh, adoration to the, at the Blessed Sacrament, and it just has really changed my life. For 2,000 years, our family has celebrated life and prayed for our world. We cared for the poor, started hospitals, blessed marriages, and educated generations of children. Guided by the Holy Spirit, we compiled the Bible. We are the Catholic Church, with over one billion in our family, and the church started by Jesus. If you've been away, come home to your parish and visit catholicscomehome.org today.
Aurelio, after never having really formation as a child, after finding excuses and having the addiction of pornography and drifting away from the faith, you finally were taking that step to come home, enrolling in RCIA. How did Catholics Come Home play a part in your journey back to the faith and to strengthen your faith? Well, I remember one Sunday after getting home from uh, church, and it's kind of a lazy afternoon, and I turned on EWTN, and there's a show called Catholics Come Home. And I started to watch it, and then I started to get emotional, and, and I realized what's, I, I'm that person in that show. Sure, we all have a past, huh? Yeah, we all have a past, and I just get, kept getting more emotional and emotional. My wife comes into the living room and says, what you, what's the matter with you? Uh, oh, nothing, I'm just watching some show on TV. <laughs> you didn't want to fess up to the fact that you were crying because you knew God's mercy, just like those folks on the show were talking about. That's true, I, I realized that God uses every method he can to reach my heart. Praise God, and I'm glad he did, and I'm glad you opened your heart, and that you had this good priest who helped you to come home. And I'm glad Catholics Come Home played a part in keeping you strong in your faith. Now that you're home to the church, how has your marriage changed? Oh, it's, it's amazing. I tell Maria, I love you more now than the day that we got married. Praise God. And she looks at me with a look like, I don't get it. And so I can't explain it. But that's the love that God has given the two of us. Right. You felt God's love and now you're reflecting that to your own wife. What other things are you involved in at the parish? What other uh, practices do you have that help strengthen your faith? Well, soon after I finished RCIA, um, local uh, Knights of Columbus group uh, grabbed me right off the get-go and said, you're going to be a knight. <laughs> Good for them. And then uh, there's also a, a, a new Bible study group, and it's a Hispanic Bible study group Wonderful. in our local church. And uh, a couple of years ago, they invited me to be part of their group. Nice. And I speak Spanish, but I don't speak it at home as often as we should. Right. And this group of uh, just awesome men is bringing the, the real man out of me. Gotcha. And you have accountability. You've got a faith group now that tells you what it's like to be a real father, a real husband, a real man, and a son of God. Yeah. It, we meet every Tuesday, and we do a short Bible study, and we do uh, adoration to, at the Blessed Sacrament. Beautiful. And it just has really changed my life. Aurelio, we thank God that you're home to the church. We thank God for his mercy on your life to get rid of the addiction. We thank God that you are now spreading the faith and sharing it with others and a strong Catholic. Welcome home. Thank you, Tom. Be not afraid. Be not afraid was the mantra of Pope St. John Paul II. It's what Archangel Gabriel told Mary at the Annunciation. And it's in the Bible 365 times, one for every day of the year. Decades ago in college football, a young man named Roy Rigels recovered a fumble before halftime as he heard the crowd cheering, go, go. But in his confusion, the crowd was actually yelling, no, no, as he ran the wrong way to the wrong end zone. He was so dejected during halftime and afraid to face the fans by coming back into the game. Just then, the coach approached the humiliated wrong way Roy and said, Roy, we need you on our team. It's not about you, it's about our team. Now get back on the field and play. Roy played the best second half of his life and was transformed. Sometimes we too try to avoid circumstances or are afraid after a bad experience. When I traveled to Barcelona years ago, I saw a bullfight arena. In a bullfight, the little five foot matador takes on a one and a half ton bull. Much of the action centers around a little red cape. Most bulls chase the little red cape until they give up, and some die at the hands of the matador. However, if those big bulls would ever realize that the real enemy was not the waving red cape, but the little matador, the little matador wouldn't stand a chance. You see, the devil distracts us with those mirages or little red capes too. Traffic jams, co-workers, bills, 
unanswered emails, unkind people, or dwelling on past regrets like Wrong Way Roy. But St. Paul reminds us in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, our battle isn't against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. So let's learn how to be not afraid by trusting in the divine mercy of the resurrected Lord who already won the victory for us. Here's your chance to get active in the new evangelization. Visit the catholicscomehome.org website and click on the Shop tab. Here, you can order a Catholics Come Home book, evangelization cards, a DVD of the Evangemercials, or a car magnet. If you or someone you know has come home to the church thanks in part to Catholics Come Home, let us know. Or if you have a comment, question, or want to support our mission, email us at info at catholicscomehome.org or write to us at Catholics Come Home, P.O. Box 1802, Roswell, Georgia, 30077. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Aurelio was one of 12 children and he was baptized as a Catholic, yet only had nominal faith formation in his youth. He rarely attended church while growing up. As an adult, Aurelio and his wife were married in the Catholic Church and began to grow in their faith, but Aurelio's siblings began falling away from their faith. Soon he drifted as well. But thanks to EWTN and Catholics Come Home, and especially the Blessed Mother, Aurelio was guided home to Jesus and his Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. Thank you for joining us in this episode of Catholics Come Home. Please keep Aurelio and his family and all of us at Catholics Come Home in your prayers. Remember to fulfill your role in the new evangelization and help love somebody to heaven.